not that I ever was practiced, but welcome to my show, my little podcast, my little corner of East Texas where I talk about spinning and knitting, the master knitting program, some things I've sewn, um, and some things I've finished lately, all kinds of fibery goodness. Um, welcome. You can find all the information about where to find me right down there in the down bar. I won't go into all that right now. I have a lot to talk about and it's getting ready to storm outside and I probably have a dog that is going to come find me, the same dog that kept me up all last night because she doesn't do well in thunderstorms and it looks like we have a lot of that in the forecast. So let's get started. Um, I have been doing a lot of work on my master knitting program since I last talked to you guys, uh, and I have a lot to share about that. But before I get into that, I want to just talk a little bit about what I finished. Um, I have one of my favorite baskets here. It's a great big Longaberger picnic basket. Oh, it's really too big to even show you. I didn't realize it's going to be that big, but it has a lot of my things in it. So let me get started. My first finished object is the uh, Busta Beanie. Now, I just heard a dog outside the door. Um, I talked about this last time. This is knit with Jameson's Spindrift. And it's a really good pattern for beginning Fair Isle knitters to start with. There's, you don't have to carry the floats. As you can see on the back here, because there's no more than a three stitch stretch. And you only carry floats if you get beyond that. I usually twist my floats every third or fourth stitch some Fair Isle knitters like to go as much as five. I put a pom-pom on top and I'm not sure about whether I like it. I think mostly because I've gotten used to all those very nice pom-poms that are floating around out there and I'm used to seeing hats with that so I probably will end up ordering one of those furry pom-poms to go on top because this this looks kind of silly to me now. Uh, and it was actually made with my biggest pom-pom maker, which used to be considered a jumbo, but nowadays I think it's not. They must be making them bigger than when I bought mine because the pom-poms have gotten rather large in the last few years. But this is my Busta Beanie. I'm not going to put it on because I look pretty silly with hats on. I wear them when I'm really, really cold, but other than that, I usually don't wear them. Um, mine did turn out a little bit longer. Well, actually, it didn't turn out a little bit longer. It's just longer. I think actually it's meant to be worn as a little bit of a slouch in it. Um, and that's fine because that's what I like. So this is a finished object. Now, I have started, I have reinstituted my UFO Thursday. And I believe I talked about that on my last podcast. I did this many years ago, and it really helped me focus knitting the things that had gone by the wayside that I really didn't want to knit anymore. Um, so every Thursday, I have pulled out something that really needs to be finished, that I don't really feel like finishing. And January was the Busta Beanie. I'll, I'll show you what's next in just a second, but I want to tell you that my mother used to always tell me I hated to return phone calls. I don't like talking on the phone. And she used to always tell me, Becky, call first thing in the morning, get it over with, and then you won't stew about it all day long. And so I've used that principle with my UFO Thursday. First thing, um, every morning, actually, I need to explain this a little bit better. On UFO Thursday, the only thing I knit all day is whatever UFO project I'm working on. 
All the rest of the days, first thing in the morning, I pull out a UFO and I spend 15 minutes knitting on it every single day. And that has gotten me a lot of progress this month. Now the next thing I'm going to show you doesn't really feel like it's progressing, but I know it is. Um, and that would be my Diamond Fizz Shawl. Now, I neglected to get a picture of this to show you guys what this is even going to look like. But, this is a pattern by Boo Knits. She's a British designer. And she has very lacy patterns. And lots of beads. Every single one of them. And this one is no exception. Let me get myself situated here. You really won't be able to tell what this looks like because it really needs blocking. But this is called the Diamond Fizz Shawl. Now, what I wanted, what I was going for when I picked the yarn for this is I needed a neutral yarn because usually I gravitate to really colorful yarns and I needed something that was neutral. And so this yarn is one of my favorites. It's called Dye for Yarn, D-Y-E-E. -E. I mean D-Y-E, let me see if I can get this. Let me cover my eyes up so it'll focus. This is a Tussa Silk, and it's a fingering weight. And I have knit several shawls with this, and I absolutely love it. It's a single ply. Let's see if you can see that. And it's just beautiful. It has a gorgeous sheen to it. And I'm going to share a couple gadgets with you today. I think I've already told you about this. I really do love these. They're great for uh, keeping your needles tucked away and they hold everything nice and tidy because I'm mid-row on this. Now, let me show you my beads first, and then I'm going to talk a little bit more about the shawl. I am using triangular beads. I'm using my Yuki. I really apologize that I have no sunshine, and this is about the best I'm going to be able to do. I can't tell if that's in focus, but they're triangular beads. I normally keep them in, I make this drink that has turmeric in it, and um, I get it from Walmart, my turmeric, and it's a beautiful glass jar, and when I'm done, I like to put my beads in it, but I don't have it. Right now what I have is just a little canning jar, and I don't know if you can see these. I did put a picture on Instagram of them, but these particular ones are, well, I'm just really not going to be able to show you, I don't think. They are, um, they're clear, but they're, they're silver lined with some opalescent, that's not the word, um, I don't know what I'm trying to say here, other than they're beautiful. They're beautiful and I love them, and there's lots of beads in this. Now, this has been my UFO project for, for February. We're getting close to the end of February, and I have been working tirelessly on this almost every day, plus I've had three UFO Thursdays, I think now, that I've worked on it all day long. And one row, one row is taking me two hours and 15 minutes. 
And the reason for that is the last, get a place so it won't fall off, the last five rows of this are very bead intense. Within one repeat, within one repeat, I can have three to four beads within a repeat. Now, one of the tips I wanted to share, I wanted to share two tips with you guys. This one is for my lace knitting. I think I've mentioned before that I cut up these little bitty straws. See if you can see that. And I use them as my place markers. And that is particularly helpful when, like in this repeat right here, I have a yarn over before that place marker. And on a couple of these rows, my position on the place marker has changed a stitch. So all I have to do, because this is flexible, I can pop that stitch over to the other side, or I can also, right down here, I had to make a center double decrease, and I was able to work it through the um, stitch marker, and then pop that stitch marker over without actually taking it off. So that is a lace tip I have for you. And also, I've mentioned this before, but um, you will do yourself a huge favor if you start to learn how to read your pattern. And by that, I mean just look at, the, look at what you're knitting, and when you're off a stitch, you'll be able to tell. Like pretty early on, I had memorized that this spine right here that's going down had yarn overs on either side of it and I was making this straight drop down and that straight drop down had a bead on it every few rows and so I knew that if I got there got to the end of my little stitch marker and I didn't have enough stitches that I had messed up somehow. And that happens, that happens, but fortunately, if you're using stitch markers and you get to the end of that little stitch marker, you can tick back and figure out what happened. And lots of times, all it is is a dropped yarn over or yarn over that you didn't pick up. So I always do that. I always use stitch markers. And then on the back side, when I'm knitting a resting row, I count. I know how many stitches I'm supposed to have between each stitch marker. And I count all the way across that row just to make sure I haven't dropped one. Because they're real easy to pick up on the back side. So this is my Diamond Fizz. And I am in the bind off. So I'm doing a little Pico bind off, which is probably going to take me eight or nine hours at this rate. And the tip I wanted to share with you when you're working little Pico bind offs is if you work this one, this one is you cast on two stitches you bind off three stitches. You cast on two, you bind off three. You cast on two, you bind off three. Well, what I do to make a really tight, tidy pico is to cast on two on the very tips, the very tips of my needle, and to bind off the first two on the very tip of my needle. And then that third stitch, I knit all the way back here um, to get a looser stitch. And that gives you a really pretty little Pico bind off. So hopefully by the time February is over, 
my February UFO will be finished and it will be beautiful and I will love it. And it's kind of like how when you give birth, the whole thing as you're going through it is pretty miserable, but when you're done, you get this beautiful baby. And that's what I think will be happening with this. I'm very weary of this project, but I was bound and determined to do UFO Thursday so I could get this finished and move on to other things. And the last little gadget I want to show you with lace knitting before I move on are my prim um, tatting needles. Can you see these? Now the old model was just straight up and down. The new, newer version is tapered right here. It doesn't hold quite as many beads, but you actually get a little bit of leverage here. And so when I put a bead on a stitch, I have my fingertips all the way down here to the end as I work that. I'm not like doing this motion. I have it all the way down to the end and I'm just doing this. So these are prim. They're the 1.0 milliliters. Milliliters? Millimeters. <laughs> it's millimeters with size. It's milliliters with measurements, right? Anyways, um, I love these. I could not bead without them. So that's my UFO. That's my finished project, object. That's what I'm working on. I'm going to share a little bit about Wonderland, a little bit about my sewing makes, and then I'm going to spend the rest of the time talking about master knitting and a little bit of personal stuff that's been going on. So if you're not interested in those things, you can move on. There's so many great podcasts out there, and I really do appreciate you guys sticking around and listening to me blather on. Um, we are in the middle of the, well, we're not in the middle. We're at the beginning of the Wonderland Sock Club. I have released two patterns. Um, the last pattern I released were the Duchess Socks. And I've only had a few people knit these. So I want to make sure everybody has gotten their pattern. It has made me slow down a little bit designing the rest of them because um, I kind of wanted us to knit them all together as we went along. So that's probably why I delved back into the Master Knitting program. I'm going to give you guys a little bit longer to get this going before I release the next pattern. Anyways, um, the pattern is available on Ravelry. It's a standalone for $2, which will include all six Wonderland pro uh, patterns plus two bonus patterns. So check that out if you're interested. And if you've knit these and you haven't posted your pictures in our Ravelry group, please do so. Because I, I am just thrilled seeing them knit up. It gives my heart a special joy. So um, that's the sock. And I've been spending the rest of the time on the um, Mad Tea Party shawl design. Last time when I was trying to do the drawstring for you guys and I couldn't get it drawn, I figured out later on that yarn was wrapped around it. So that's why it wouldn't shut. So now you see I can go like that. Anyways, um, I have finished the second section of the Mad Tea Party shawl. And first I'll show you the yarn. This is from 
the Wonderland Yarn Company, or the collection, I guess. And this one is called Mad Hatter. And these were the yarns that when I kept looking at them, I had bought them to design a sock, one of the socks for the Wonderland Club. And I just loved them so much. I want, really saw them in a shawl. So, I'm designing a pie shawl. And I have finished. This is very difficult to show because it's on my circular um, lick of needles. And I am determined to keep it on my circular needles. Looks like a little nest. I'm determined to keep it on these. Actually, one of the reasons I like knitting pie shawls is because in your nest you can put your yarn. Um, I want to keep these on 24 inch cirques because Elizabeth Zimmerman in her book, let's see if I can find it, this one right here in Elizabeth Zimmerman's Knitter's Almanac, in July, the July project, she has, this book is e projects for each month of the year, and in the July project, it's a pie shawl, and she talks about this being a great project, a great traveling project, because you can fit the whole circumference of your project on a set of 24 needles, 24 inch needles. So I'm at 256 stitches. I'm going to try, I'm, I'm getting ready to do another round of increases, which will put me at 500, something 500 256 uh, close to 600 stitches I guess um, we'll see if I can get it on my 24 inches I'll probably have to graduate this is a fingering weight yarn anyways let me show you the pattern so I started out with the Emily Ochre circular cast on and this whole first section that is the plain stockinette right there and the little yarn overs is that section. Then I doubled the circumference and did this brioche section right here with the gray and the yellow. And then I moved into this broken arrow section. Let's see if you can see this very well. It's a broken arrow lace design. Very easy to memorize. And I'm getting ready to move into the next color section. I'm on the last row. And then I will do yarn over um, increases all the way around to double the circumference. And I have not quite decided. I think I know what I'm going to do. I kind of thought about doing the brioche section with the new color and the gray, but I actually think I'm going to do a textured pattern with the new color. And then after the textured pattern, then I will go into the brioche again with that color and the gray um, before I move into another gray lace section. I've ordered some darker gray and black um, tonal yarn to go in the end with the bigger design. But I think what I've decided is the gray sections will be lace and the colored sections will be texture. But this is, this is such a relaxing, enjoyable knit. Um, I'm totally in love with these needles. Makes it all the more enjoyable. And I just, I love knitting pie shawls. It's just, it's, I just love it. So anyways, I've been working on that. And the rest of my time 
excuse me while I bend down. The rest of my time has been spent on the master knitting program. So without further ado, let me show you some of my sewing makes and then I'll talk about that. So um, I have nine things on my sewing make list this year and I've completed two of them. My knitting make list is not looking so great, but my sewing make list is. So I finished and I, I apologize, these are really wrinkled because I wore them last night. But I made myself some pajamas, some pajama bottoms out of the um, sweater. I think this is called the Noel sweater by um, Cotton and Still. And they're so soft already. I've washed them maybe once or twice and they're already soft and and I I'm really enjoying them. I put a little tag on the back here so I could easily see what the back is. And um yeah, I want to make a pair of pajama pants every quarter. And then I'll have some new pajamas next year. And the other thing I made, which is going to be kind of hard to show, is um, I bought the Grain Line Studio Linden sweatshirt pattern. And a lot of you may have seen my picture on Instagram. It's, it was really hard to take a picture because um, I was just doing this. <laughs> And every time I did that, that wrinkled up all of this. So, um, anyways, it's just a basic kind of sweatshirt pattern with a raglan sleeve. And um, it has the knit, a little knit band around the top. And the cuff is like this, sewn over. And then I used a little overlock stitch that my machine has. And then the bottom, the bottom has, there's a band around the bottom. Now this is my muslin because I have not sewn with uh, knit fabric in a very long time. And I got this at Walmart. And I will tell you, it is so soft. I love it. I have a pet peeve about t-shirts. I want my t-shirts to be very, very soft. And so I don't really like to buy cheaper t-shirts. And my other pet peeve is that I'm long torsoed. So because I have a long torso, um, sweatshirts, even high quality sweatshirts, if they shrink at all, my tummy hangs out which is not a pretty sight when you're 61. And so um, I bought this and I thought this is perfect because first of all, I'm not real crazy about spending five extra dollars on a t-shirt because I'm, I have a long torso. And then it just seems like the places I have ordered t-shirts from over the years, their quality is getting worse and worse. And so it kills me to pay that much money for something that's going to shrink and or something that's long enough and the quality still stinks. So I will tell you guys that my $9 Walmart fabric shirt this is so soft, it did not shrink, and I see lots of linden sweatshirts in my future. Um, you can use sweater material fabric. I like to push the sleeves up, and I'm just gonna make more of these. I think it's, I think it's great. So I'm really excited that I'm doing this Make 9 this year for 
um, sewing. I'm really enjoying getting back into sewing. All right, let's move into the master knitting. So, I posted on Instagram that I had finished all 19 of my swatches. There are 19 swatches to knit on level two. And I've spent the last three, work, three weeks working on the cable flare compensation swatches. And I was very excited because I thought I was finished. But I will tell you about that in a second. Let me first share those swatches that I did knit on that before I get into the oh dear part of the program. But I did think it might be kind of fun for me to go through my binder and show you all the swatches that I've knit because I really have enjoyed this program and I'm a big advocate for it. And I know some of you have sent me messages asking me more about it. And I just thought it might be a little interesting for some of you to see the kind of things I've had to do in it. Now, I know for others, you may could care less about this and that's fine. You can, um, go on to the next podcast and watch watch somebody else and and thank you for visiting with me but let me go ahead and get going on this so i'll move this aside let me move this down cable flare compensation let's talk about that i recently saw a podcast and I'm not going to name the podcaster's name. And I'm not going to tell the sweater that she was talking about. But as I start talking about it, some, some of you may know, um, may recognize right off who I'm talking about. It's no fault of hers at all. But I do feel like it may have been part of the um, designer's fault. So what happens when you have, um, when you knit cables, let me get my swatches out here. All right, so, this is one of the swatches I'm having to re-knit, but when you, often when you knit a cable more than often. The designer usually takes care of this for you. Actually this isn't a good example because I did compensate for it. You have to use your imagination. Um, when you have a cable section it has its own gauge. Yeah this is going to be about gauge and the border around it, seed stitch, also has a different gauge. And if you don't compensate for the fact that the border that you use at the edge of a cable, be it seed stitch, be it garter stitch, be it ribbing. If you don't calculate this gauge and compare it to your cable gauge, you get a flaring result. This part right here, let me see if I can make it happen. This part, the part down here, will buckle a little bit and be bumpy rather than laying flat. And this particular podcaster that I was watching had knit a beautiful sweater and knit a beautiful pocket with a garter tab up here. And her pocket was buckling out from the 
um, sweater. Now she said she thought that in the end it was all fine and good when she wore it against her body. And I had I had that pattern and I took a look at it and the designer did have you go down two needles or one needle size when you knit the top part up here. But typically if you're not going to compensate do a compensation in your gable your cable you would go down two needle sizes but let me explain a little bit more about what I mean so in the master knitting program what you have to do is you pick a cable and I picked this cable right here you may have seen on Instagram. Just a little simple rope cable. And then you knit you, you knit the um, a seed stitch swatch. Which you use to calculate because my it was going to be knit. I was going to have a seed stitch border around it like this. So what I had to do was to get the exact gauge of the seed stitch swatch. So I knew how many stitches per inch were in this. And then I got the exact measurement of the widest part of the cable and how many stitches were within that and then I calculated how many stitches per inch would I need of these to equal this. And then you do a little bit of math and what I did when I did all those calculations was I found out that I needed to add one stitch for each one of these cables in order to make this lie flat. And so after I knit down here on my last row or my first row of the cable, I went ahead and I increased one stitch in the middle of each one of these cables. And then I worked all my cables and then up here I decreased that one stitch. And that helped this all to lie flat. Now, this may sound familiar to you if you've knit a sweater or you've worked, you have started out with ribbing and on your last row of ribbing you've had to do all these increases. That is for this very reason. The designer has thought ahead, she's done all the math and she's figured out how to compensate for that and she's added on some stitches and often when you get up to the top of your shoulders you decrease those stitches down again when you have your whatever you're going to do up here. So that is cable compensation. You compensate for the size of your cable. Now um, in between the length of time when I first started level two, last November, not this previous one, but the one before that, a new committee came on board and they revised all of the programs. And they were, they were very small revi revisions. 
nothing nothing really major I thought but I just thought it would be good for me to not good prudent of me wise of me to uh, double check all the swatches that I had knit against the old program and lo and behold I discovered that in the old program um, it just told you to pick pick a cable pattern for this whole pick a cable pattern and do the whole exercise with that cable pattern and it did say um, don't use something you've used in level one so I went ahead and I just picked this simple little rope thing cable and then a couple nights ago I was checking to see oh, I wonder what other other people on this level have used and they're using really <laughs> complex beautiful cables and I thought I wonder why they're doing that when all they had to do was just a simple little simple little cable well uh, last night as I was attaching or yesterday when I was attaching all the little tags that have to go on this I thought I, I need to read and see if I need to change anything on my swatch sheet and I saw it's now marked in orange it's now marked in orange right there I, it says Try to choose cables that show off your ability to work a complicated rather than a simple cable. <laughs> and I, oh no, three weeks down the drain. And then I thought, no, it's not three weeks down the drain. Um, because a big part of the master knitting program is to be able to follow directions precisely. Because what happens when we don't? right so late last night um, I did go ahead and I picked another another cable pattern I've started over I'm hoping this one's okay <laughs> I was a little bit limited because your swatch can't be wider than eight and a half stitches I think I mean eight and a half inches and so when you start getting into wider um, patterns, your swatches get bigger. And I've gone ahead, because of that, I dropped down to a size 6 needle. Oh, and that's what I was going to show you, which I didn't bring. I don't have it anywhere around here. But one of the things I've done with every level of program is I treat myself to some signature needles that make knitting the swatches just a little bit more enjoyable. So I dropped down to a size six because I know that will get my swatch smaller. And this is the one I'm doing. Um, and I will knit up three repeats for that and get that done in the, this week. But that also means I have to rewrite the pattern because along with the cable compensation swatches, you had to write a full length pattern. Um, as you would as if you were publishing it and so I have to rewrite the pattern I have to do the math all over again and then I decided for the swatch before this this is actually the one that's going to show the flare but it's all pinned down but I can guarantee you when I take this off the um, mat here this is going to be flared out underneath there because I have not compensate, done any compensation. So, yeah, the light. I've got an ot lamp right here and it's really blowing everything out. I apologize for that. Um, so I'm back at square one, so to speak, on the cable swatches, but I'll have them done by the weekend. I'm bound and determined. Um, because as soon as I'm done with the swatches then I'm moving on I'm working on the the vest right now and I've got the Argyle socks to do the uh, Fair Isle wristlet and then I have two more book reports and then I have 
the history of knitting report to do. Thank you so much for stopping by and spending this time with me on a very gloomy, stormy day. It's very dark outside, very dark. So I apologize for the lighting in my room, but there's not gonna be any sun for at least 10 more days. And I knew that I was behind on this. I was gonna share a little bit with you. Um, my mother went into the hospital about two and a half, three weeks ago. And we spent a very scary week. I slept with her every night in the hospital and didn't leave her. I went home a couple times, um, but she was quite ill and she's okay now, uh, but it was related to diabetes, I think and we had an infectious disease doctor checking her for all known diseases known to man in and out of the country. We had uh, a podiatrist come in at the end because she just, well, I'm not gonna go into her personal stuff other than to say it was very scary. She was quite ill. She had 103 temperature every night and was talking out of her mind and She's 83 years old, and that was scary, but um, we have her. She's doing good. She's going to need to go to rehab a little bit, but and she'll be playing golf soon. I know she's playing bridge today, so she's very happy to get back to her routine a little bit. So that kind of took a lot of wind out of my cell there, and during that time, I found the only thing I could knit on was my crochet granny stripe blanket. I mean, I didn't, I wasn't even knitting. I was crocheting, right? Um, and all this time, um, I guess I'll have a little confession here. When crocheters come up to me and they say, oh, I can never knit because it's so hard and I've always poo-pooed that, and I said, you know what? It's just a knit stitch, and it's just a purl stitch, and if you can crochet, you can knit. Well, let me tell you, I could not knit. I would sit there and stare at a pattern, and it made no sense to me. The only thing I could do was to pick up a crochet hook and do a little bit of that, and I really didn't do much of that. So my hat's off to all of you crocheters who have said that. Um, I've been a little bit of a crochet snob, and now I see the value. Boy, did that project help me through a tough spot, that little bit of crocheting. So um, if you're a crocheter, I will still encourage you to try to knit, but your craft is just as worthy as knitting is. So thank you so much for stopping by with me today. I really appreciate it. I've just blathered on and on today, um, but I've enjoyed getting caught up with you guys. And I hope you will stop by again soon. And I hope my next podcast is much sooner. So for now, enjoy your knitting. Enjoy your crocheting. Enjoy your makes, your sewing. Um, take time to do a little bit of that for yourself. It's, it's good for you. It's good for you. And we all need that little bit of outlet of creativity. So um, take